Hello everybody. A warm welcome to our friend Nicolas Megret from disnovation.org. They are making contemporary art with research and hacking to question the positive ideology for technology to stimulate a post-growth technology narrative. So I'm quite interested and give him a warm welcome. Hello everyone. Oh, does it work? Can you hear me? Hey. Yeah. Hello. So I'm Nicolas Megret, uh, and together with uh, Maria Oskowska, we initiated the disnovation.org collective. And our collective uh, intend to reveal and challenge the dominant ideology of technological innovation and to circulate alternative narratives. So I will uh, show you a selection of projects, and mainly it's uh, a few projects selected to resonate with uh, the CCC and the topics. Um, uh, here, so uh, we do um, basically uh, curation. So we organize a festival and we curate uh, uh, art spaces and uh, different uh, series of um, projects around basically uh, the rhetoric of technological innovation and the, the effect of this dominant ideology on society. Uh, we also uh, work on um, publication and books. I will uh, get back to that in a minute. And we do uh, artworks and site-specific projects that I will present in the second half of this talk. So the first part uh, will be focusing on uh, our curatorial practices around this idea of uh, counter narratives on technological innovation. So I will introduce three works. Uh, the first one is uh, the pirate book. So it's a book uh, we started to compile in uh, 2014, and. Um, in 2040. Uh, it's a compilation of stories uh, about uh, sharing and distributing, distributing uh, cultural content outside the boundaries of uh, local economies, politics, laws, religions, and so on. So with this work, we, we try to explore the notions uh, such as uh, the piracy of necessity, um, the idea of new originals, and um, I think it's interesting to go back to this uh, project, to come back to this project in the context, context of the Anthropocene and uh, the potential imminent collapse. Um, because I think there is a need for uh, non-techno-solutionist and uh, non-techno-positivist stories at the moment, and somehow a need to develop uh, post-growth narratives. So we will see what we can learn from uh, the following examples uh, taken from the book. Um, around um, concerns like uh, repair, care, maintenance, and creative appropriation. So um, the first uh, excerpt from the book uh, I would like to focus on um, is an example from uh, Mexico uh, given by uh, our contributor, Yota Izquierdo. And basically it focuses on um, <coughs> the stories uh, of uh, craftsmen that uh, works for improving the practices uh, of street city vendors in uh, Mexico. So I will, I will play a, a quick excerpt of it. Soy conocido como uno de los gemelos fantásticos aquí del barrio de la Merced. Entonces el día de hoy este, que quiero presentarles este, las, las bocinas, cómo ha ido evolucionando a través del, del tiempo. Esta inspiración viene desde la, de las personas que, que traían sus bocinitas, ciegos que trabajan en el metro, que, que ellos ocupan para cantar. Entonces ahí empieza la, la onda del movimiento de las bocinas acá en México, lo que es en el sistema de transporte colectivo metro. Entonces nosotros el día de hoy este, se nos facilita trabajar de una manera lo más, lo más práctico, lo más fácil. Me presento diciéndoles muy buenas tardes, tengan todos ustedes, señores usuarios, y ya les pongo la música. Y así... bajando un poquito el volumen y les empezamos a gritar, les, les gritamos, señores usuarios, muy buenas tardes, tengan todos, todos ustedes, en esta ocasión les traigo a la venta, disco compacto en formato normal, disco compacto que le contiene 20 grandes temas, la música cumbia. 
in the book we cover uh, multiple stories in this sort. Uh, we just focus on a couple of those. Uh, the second one um, is uh, based in a style. Uh, it's a contribution by uh, Christopher Kirkley. And <coughs> he is presenting basically how a big part of uh, music distribution uh, in Sahel is done uh, through copies uh, between dumb, dumb phones using uh, Bluetooth. So it's a way uh, somehow to, to create a circulation of contents um, by um, nearest neighbor uh, dynamics, basically. And the third example I would like just to introduce is um, uh, El Paquete Seminal. Basically, it's in the context of um, uh, Cuban uh, lack of uh, fast internet or internet at all. Um, <coughs> basically, El, El Paquete Seminal is a sort of a substitute to the internet uh, in the form of a package. Uh, it's an hard drive, as you can see here. And this hard drive uh, also circulates uh, one copy at a time. And it's uh, uh, basically a compilation of uh, all the content um, that uh, is considered to be missing um, for people. So you can see uh, on this uh, hard drive uh, uh, TV shows, uh, books, uh, movies, music, um, and all the sorts of content you could expect um, from uh, an internet uh, browsing experience. So you can find uh, this book online for free, and uh, we cover uh, many other stories, but tonight um, uh, I will just um, present those and um, connect with uh, this last contribution by uh, Clément Renaud. Uh, he uh, did a um, long-term uh, six years uh, research in uh, China, and he shared with us um, this uh, story um, about um, uh, Shanghai uh, technology production. Uh, it's basically um, something between piracy and hybridation in uh, Chinese manufacturing, and I will focus on uh, this one a little bit more. So. In his article, um, uh, Clément Renault uh, described a specific uh, local tech innovation named Shanghai. Uh, the Shanghai culture is a mix of piracy, DIY, and anti-establishment. Uh, it literally means a, a mountain fort fortress, and it comes from a, a novel uh, from the 13th century uh, that tells the story of um, a group of outlaws that um, uh, that hides in, in the mountain uh, to be outside uh, the, the system and outside uh, the regulation of the state, basically. So, in a more recent context, uh, Shanghai refers uh, basically uh, to manufacturing. Um, it emerged in, uh, in the 50s, uh, for instance, in Hong Kong, uh, to describe uh, small-scale factories uh, that were producing cheap, uh, low-quality items, um, and mainly uh, counterfeit uh, products of famous brands like uh, Gucci or Nike and they sold uh, those products on markets that will not buy the fancy, expensive originals. And as uh, electronic manufacturing migrated to, to Shenzhen uh, in the early 2000s, uh, this informal uh, network of Shanghai uh, production found the perfect product in the mobile phone. Um, so our first uh, acquisition in this collection uh, was uh, basically the, the Ghana phone, um, and we, we've been very intrigued by uh, this, uh, this device. So, basically, um, this device is, has not been conceived uh, for its uh, superficial design, uh, but it's, it's been conceived to, to fill a gap, a need, or a niche uh, market. Um, so, the, this phone is a power bank. Uh, basically, uh, to, to fill the gap of uh, the frequent uh, power cuts in Ghana. But it's also, uh, so it has a battery that can last for a week. Uh, you can also charge other devices with it, uh, recharge a computer, another phone. Uh, you can also use it uh, as a light. So that's why you have a hook uh, to connect it on the, on the ceiling. Um, and basically, it's a whole uh, package of um, functions and properties that were designed specifically for a local market that no any brand um, were uh, paying attention at. So, 
we were very interested by uh, this track of research and we wanted to dig some more. So we started uh, with a simple uh, protocol. Uh, we started to collect uh, hybrid phones that were combining uh, multiple functions and designed for those niche markets uh, all over the place, mainly uh, in the global south, but not only, you will see. Uh, so you can find um, lots of fancy and weird devices that I will show. Uh, and those devices, we've been collecting them um, in markets in Shenzhen, like Wachan Bay, and also online, like on Taobao, AliExpress, and so on. So one of the reasons uh, that we wanted to focus uh, our research on mobile phones, because Sh Shanghai production is not only about mobiles, it's about every kind of technology, I would say. Um, but we, we kind of wanted to stick to one sort of device to have this continuity over 20 years. Um, and also because somehow uh, a huge contrast could be seen through the mobile phone between a sort of a, a North Hemisphere uh, culture or this somehow this standardized culture of the, uh, the black rectangle we all have in our pockets here. Um, and um, this kind of non-normalized uh, technological imaginaries that were emerging there. Um, and somehow it reminds us, I think, that other technological possibilities always exist uh, beyond the ultra-normalized industry. So um, I will dig into a, a few of those. Um, so each of, of those examples, I think, uh, tell a specific story uh, and reveal uh, specific uses and cultures. So here you can see a, a lighter phone. So it's basically a phone that does uh, cigarette lighter. Um, <coughs> this one is, a, I would say, a walking cigarette pack that also includes a mobile phone, or perhaps the other way around. <laughs> <coughs> and this one is a, a razor phone, so it's a phone that includes a walking shaver. So since uh, 2015, we've been collecting about hundreds of those uh, hybrid phones. And I will zoom into a few of uh, uh, very in interesting specimens and, and stories. So here you can see uh, the card phone. It's the size of, the, of a credit card. Um, it used to be the cheapest on the market. Um, it cost about $12. And it's made of a single board. Um, so basically, it can be very easily replicated. and. Uh, optimized, modified, and so on. Uh, so that's why it, it's been called uh, the Gong iPhone, which means open source. And you, you could find this board in multiple versions uh, in the later uh, generation of phones. Uh, I will present in a minute. So this one is called the Buddha phone. Um, it's been designed as a digital alternative for Buddhist prayers uh, and related uh, religious activities. So basically, it replicates, uh, for instance, uh, the ritual components like uh, the burning of incense, uh, purification rites, uh, meditative music, and more. So all of those um, features are included in uh, basically um, uh, the UX of the, the phone. Thank you. 
So this is the sound system phone. Um, it's been designed for mainly the elderly people. Um, so uh, the favorite, one of the favorite activities of uh, the elderly in China is uh, group dancing on public square in evenings. Uh, and uh, this specific phone uh, has been designed for this purpose. Uh, so it comes with uh, several gigabytes of uh, old-fashioned uh, communist songs uh, that uh, uh, Chinese uh, pensioners are particularly uh, keen on. Uh, it, ha it has a huge buttons. Um, I mean, it's really designed for elderly. So the device is like that size. Um, and there is also a support to stand in front of the dancers and a powerful uh, light torch uh, to ensure uh, a smooth return home after the dance. Big, small, nice and neat to put away. Up the bums. I'm a pro, we've got 20 in 10 minutes. Why Mars bars? Because they're available in most of the visit halls. You can't take something that might not be there because if you do, they're going to notice it different. I'd say that there's probably 75% of prisoners have phones in, in jail. I'd take that in on a person um, in places where you wouldn't get searched. The front of your trousers, in your bra. So this one is uh, the prisoner phone, uh, or it's also called Beat the Bus. Uh, the bus is um, a device for scanning prisoners. Um, so it's actually, it's, it started on the market as the smallest phone on the market. Uh, but for some reason, it became popular among prisoners, uh, mainly in the UK, uh, because of the, its small size. It's the size of a finger. And uh, the, because of the fact also it's composed of 99% uh, of plastic. Uh, so it's barely det detectable during the checks in prisons. And uh, you can easily smuggle it uh, inside food, inside body, obviously, but also in weird ways, like inside using drones, carrier pigeons, rats, and so on. So we try to exhibit uh, all this collection of uh, weird devices in their natural <laughs> habitat, in a way. So we, we, we built a reproduction of a street market kiosk uh, where we basically showcase this collection of hybrid phones. Uh, and together with that, we, we have a couple of uh, video documentaries, like this one, uh, that kind of tell the larger Shanghai culture and Mm, focus on, on Chinese ecosystem of technological device, production and distribution. So um, that's how it looks um, when it's shown. Um, yeah, that's it for this one. Uh, and the last curatorial project uh, I'd like to introduce uh, is a work in progress. Uh, it's called the Museum of Failures. And I will start with a quote by uh, Paul Virilio. This acknowledgement of powerlessness before the upsurge of unexpected, catastrophic events forces us to reverse the usual trend which exposes us to accidents and inaugurate a new kind of museology and museography. One which consists in exposing or exhibiting the accident, all accidents, from the most commonplace to the most tragic, from natural catastrophes, Two industrial and scientific disasters, including also the kind that is too often neglected. The happy accident, the stroke of luck, the coup de foudre, or even the coup de grace. So, as you could guess uh, with this quote, um, this project is about uh, uncovering and compiling counter narratives about the history of technological innovation. Uh, and our project uh, is basically to compile uh, those uh, underrepresented stories that can help us to disrupt the dominant positivist discourse on innovation and help us maybe to, to think about technology in a post growth era. So, um, Whoops. Yeah. Uh, the project uh, takes the shape of uh, workshops, conferences, events, and we share it as a, a database and exhibitions. So this symbolic museum is structured uh, into floors. Um, they go in uh, negative numbers. 
they are somehow the, the underground counterparts of usual technological museum. So each floor is a potential um, sort of entry or perspective on the museum, sorted by topics. So you have like intentional failures, uh, fiction and dystopias, uh, risk and disasters, unexpected outcomes, and so on. Um, so the first part of this um, future uh, book is a collection of about, about it projects, flops, errors, malfunctions, business failures, ethical rejections, disasters, and they somehow reflect the outlines of our society from a historical, symbolic, poetic, and cultural point of view. Um, the second part um, of this book, though, uh, will be based on interviews and contributions, and uh, we are open to proposals. So if you have uh, stories or research on uh, post-growth technological imaginaries and counter-narratives on technological innovation, you're welcome to submit. Okay, so the second part of this talk will be about uh, our artworks, a uh, specific selection to resonate with the CCC as well. Uh, and we, we grouped it in, into this idea of uh, psychoanalysis of the hyperconnected era. Um, so the first artwork I will introduce is the pirate cinema. Um, basically, the, the, the copy culture uh, got mainstream uh, with uh, BitTorrent and uh, the Pirate Bay in the early 2000s. And it became uh, an essential part of culture for a world generation. Uh, and at the same time as this process, uh, since the early days of peer-to-peer, uh, it coexisted with uh, an intense level of surveillance. So this surveillance um, uh, was uh, conducted by universities, corporations, states, uh, sometimes for statistical purpose, just for, you know, to know uh, how much is consumed from different type of contents and so on, and most of the time for copyright infringement. And we, we, we got really interested in how we could disrupt those uh, systems uh, of network uh, surveillance, basically, and use it to reveal the dynamics uh, and the materiality of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. So basically to expose uh, the materiality of this process and the geographical dynamics of uh, the content that were consumed and shared. So I will show a few excerpts of this project. So we, we, we programmed the server uh, to use a BitTorrent and to synchronize every morning with the top 100 videos of the Pirate Bay. So it's a sort of a man-in-the-middle attack where uh, we see what people are sharing through our server. Um, so it's a, it's a way to, to, to view uh, the global dynamics uh, through one node uh, of uh, the BitTorrent network. Um, as you can see on the video, uh, it also reveals the user IP address and the countries. Uh, and somehow it's a way to uh, depict the geographical dynamics uh, of media sh sharing and uh, consumption. The next project uh, I'd like to introduce, uh, follow in this idea of content narratives, um, it's a series about uh, illicit, illicit content. It's called Blacklist. So. We got interested in uh, basically who controls and decides what should be visible or not online, or what should be blocked or not, and how those uh, lists are built and used, um, and somehow um, how maybe uh, it can be something that reveals uh, the value system uh, we live in. 
So there are numerous uh, blacklists um, you can subscribe to, uh, more or less efficient and up-to-date, um, uh, squid blacklist, shallow list, Cisco, and so on. And somehow they remind us uh, literally uh, of uh, f uh, the index of forbidden books that uh, used to exist in uh, libraries around the globe. It, it was a list basically of publication considered uh, heretical, immoral, or anti-clerical. And you know, in an internet blacklist nowadays, <coughs> you have pretty much the same. So addresses uh, that can be blocked, uh, they are organized into uh, categories, as you can see here. And uh, as a sysadmin, you can decide what type um, of uh, content you want to block. So in s such lists are used by universities, towns, airports, companies, individuals, and so on. And um, it helps you basically to restrict the, the access to specif specific content on your network. So you have categories like uh, copyright, porn, pharmacy, and so on. And you can see weird stuff, like uh, feminist, for instance. And I guess it, it reveals the, the for-profit nature of uh, this list and the fact that anything can be requested if uh, enough clients are asking for it. Um, so th this work uh, took the shape of uh, a sort of an encyclopedia in 13 volumes of 666 pages. It's basically an encyclopedia of uh, illicit and filtered sites. Um, and it is uh, structured like an old uh, phone book. Uh, it's a sort of uh, ready-made that uh, reveals the moral uh, sort of portraits or framework of the web. Blacklists is a directory of the prohibitions of the internet, deployed in the form of an encyclopedia, in 13 volumes of 666 pages each. It is an extensive collection of restricted websites, used for the automatic filtering of traffic considered illicit or licentious. Just like the intent of forbidden libraries, the Blacklist's project points out the sidelining of online content that could be dangerous for the very survival of the system. With around 2 million websites, extracted from commercial content control softwares, this collection reveals a cultural, social and ideological model of our society, through what has been deemed unfit for consultation by specific groups and institutions around the globe. So I guess you get the idea. Um, all right, so this uh, next work is a predictive output and I will need to contextualize a bit. So basically, <coughs> uh, we live in the era of uh, hyperconnectivity. And the time we spend on phone and social media has radically increased over the last 10 years. And this has a, a strong effect on us. Uh, online news and communication tends to monopolize a lot of our attention, and it does have a, a growing influence on our types of concerns and priorities. So we know about effects like a filter bubble, uh, media echo chambers, uh, and to some extent, the influence of, of social media and hyperconnection tend towards a sort of uniformization, not only of our concerns, but also somehow of our innovation and creativity. And it tends towards a higher chance of predictability of our behaviors. So standing Basically, standing from, from the art field, uh, we started to notice somehow similar patterns uh, amongst the, the artists around us. So we, we spotted numerous similar imaginaries, similar trends in each interest groups, and we started to observe um, similar topics, similar ideas, and even similar ways of realizing artworks and answering to ideas and concerns. So at some point, we were like, do we really need artists? to simply follow the trends? And do we need artists to, to just illustrate the latest techni technological buzz? Maybe no. So that's where the project started with this simple question. And we decided to automatize the, the process of mainstream creativity, we could say, and to push it toward a sort of, of the absurd. So to do that, uh, we created a bot. And this bot basically is subscribed to hundreds of RSS feeds. Uh, that's the sort of feeds we, we will get ourselves on our Twitter feed, you know? Uh, so we basically subscribe the bot to the same. And 
then the bot is using um, uh, some uh, Python library uh, to, to try to identify the, the most significant keyword in the headlines. Um, and um, those uh, keywords are stored and then reorganized uh, using tracery in a sort of generative uh, poetry to, to create a potential concept for artworks. And those concepts are reposted on Twitter and different places to uh, basically uh, create a new weird inspiration machine. Um, that's what you will see now. Predictive art bodies an algorithm that turns the latest media headlines into artistic concepts. In the age of hyperconnectivity, the perverse implications of media echo chambers are becoming more and more obvious. Groups of similar behaviors are being partitioned in filter bubbles, while the few massively reposted topics tend to monopolize most of the available attention. Such insular echo chambers strongly affect ways of thinking, resulting in increasingly homogeneous imaginaries within groups of like-minded people. Predictive art bot caricatures the predictability of media-influenced artistic concepts by automating and skirting the human creative process. But beyond mere automation, it aims to stimulate unbridled, counterintuitive and even disconcerting associations of ideas. To do so, it continually monitors emerging trends among the most influential news sources in fields as heterogeneous as politics, environment, innovation, culture, activism, or health. On this basis, it identifies and combines keywords to generate concepts of artworks in a fully automated way, ranging from unreasonable to prophetic through absurd. Each prediction becomes a thought experiment waiting to be incubated, misused or appropriated by a human host. Okay, and we also uh, commissioned a few artists to uh, interpret and uh, realize those projects a few times. Okay, the last project for tonight, uh, I see that it's almost time for me. So uh, the last project uh, is a map, uh, and it's a work in progress for uh, a future uh, long-term project. Um, and basically, uh, it focuses on um, <clears throat> the fact that the web has become one of the most impactful uh, vehicles for the propagation of ideas and, and culture. And hyperconnectivity did uh, intensify the rise of online politics and made it way easier to manipulate public opinions. And I mean, this happened uh, as a sort of uh, unprecedented, unprecedented uh, scale. Um, so, uh, you know, we've seen the emergence of uh, political bots, fake accounts, troll farm, and so on. Uh, but today I will focus uh, on the cultural aspect of this battleground. So one of the important aspects of online culture wars that we were trying to map is perhaps this notion of uh, transgression. So as one of the Trump supporters, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, used to say, uh, conservatism uh, is the new punk. Yes. And think about how the culture wars have changed, and changed very rapidly, and, and, and in a very short space of time. The dissident element in culture, punk, mischief, irreverence, is now better represented in politics by a Make America Great Again hat than by anything on the left. If you want to annoy somebody, if you want to piss your parents off, if you want to be ejected from polite society, as this poor angel has been. <laughs> there is no better way to do it than to cast a vote for Donald Trump. This, <laughs> this is the new punk. Republican is the new cool. Thank you for coming. So in the context of um, the political correctness and self-censorship, public shaming, uh, that were occurring a lot in the, the left. Uh, this obscure style of sort of iconic, cynical mockery emerged as a sort of uh, counterforce. And transgression uh, made uh, the alt-right uh, attractive in a way. Uh, and this transgressive online culture is well presented in uh, the book of Angela Nagel uh, called Kill or Normies. What seemed to hold them all together in their obscurity was a love of mocking the earnestness, 
and moral self-flattery of what felt like a tired liberal intellectual conformity, running right through from establishment liberal politics, to the more militant enforcers of new sensitivities, and from the wackiest corners of Tumblr, to campus politics. So basically, this, tr this culture of transgression uh, aligns pretty well uh, with what is called a weaponized meme. So a weaponized meme is when internet memes become part of uh, political and ideological propaganda. Um, it can be uh, done by the right, but as well by uh, all the political spectrum, like here, to fight uh, homophobia in, uh, in Russia. Um, and uh, as a starting point for this new series of projects, we wanted, we wanted to, to create a kind of mind map of the emerging online culture wars. So we use this classical uh, political compass as a framework. Um, I mean, it's a framework that has been uh, criticized a lot, but nonetheless, it became popular as a format uh, to exchange content on online forums and on the memosphere. And it often integrates non-political characters and pop preferences and so on. Um, so after studying numerous uh, critical researches on the topic, uh, like the, the Computational Propaganda Project, Angela Nagel, Florian Kramer, and so on, and also our own investigations, we started to assemble uh, a sort of cartography of weaponized meme elements with the help of uh, Baruch Gottlieb. The Online Culture Wars Project offers a provisional cartography of weaponized meme elements using a speculative political distribution. Taking the political compass as a framework, this cartography offers a symbolic representation of online ideological and political debates in the context of a growing polarization and radicalization. This ever-evolving chart is the result of a superposition of hundreds of politicized memes found online, in addition to influential political symbols, actors, and influencers. It is designed as a discussion starter, intended to expose and contextualize the present battlefield of online culture wars. So we are currently uh, continuing this map as an interactive contributive web page. Well, uh, this was a quick selection of our old and new works that somehow resonates with the CCC. Uh, and thank you for your attention. Oh, a big thank, Nicholas. Are there any questions to Nicholas? There is a microphone one. Hi, congrats. Beautiful presentation. Thanks. Um, I'm curious, what's, what have you never dared doing? What's your next step? I think it's co correlated somehow. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so as I said, um, this last project is a sort of a starting point for a, a new series of investigation and research. And at the moment, we are... Um, accumulating a lot of documents on um, online propaganda and uh, online uh, influence. Uh, and we're starting um, a new series of uh, online uh, performance uh, using and uh, basically challenging those uh, uh, strategies for uh, the manipulation of opinions. So we are yeah, trying to, to develop our own uh, propaganda um, strategies, basically. Are there any questions from the internet? No? Yeah, then a big warm applause for our thanks for Niklas. Thanks. <laughs>